welcome to the show. Um, I'm so glad to, to have you here with me. I'm, uh, I'm Mercy Russell, uh, and this is uh, the inaugural show of my um, radio show, Remarkable Relationships. I just want to mention that uh, there is roofing going on in my house today. And in fact, the roofers are right above us. So, you know, uh, that's the noise that you'll be hearing in the background. Um, so I'm going to start today um, with an introduction of the show, since this is the first show, and also of myself. Um, and But today I also will be uh, having a, a conversation, uh, you could call it an interview, it's usually more of a conversation with my colleague and friend Priscilla Friesen, and I will also be introducing her shortly too. Um, so what is the topic of this radio show? Um, in this show, my goal is to bring a fresh perspective to you on all things related to how humans develop their individual brilliance while navigating the excitement, stickiness, and resistance in their relationships. In my 39 years of working as a psychotherapist, I have been continually amazed at the ways in which people overcome challenges. My own journey led me into a deep dive into the study and application of Bowen Family Systems Theory to the universe of human behavior. I loved the big picture view, the move toward an integration of the biological sciences and the surprises that this perspective has given me. And all along the way, I have been a dogged and closeted. I'm coming out. This is a coming out for me. <laughs> I've been a closeted consumer, student and experimenter in the intuitive arts and supernatural phenomena. I began meditating and practicing yoga at 19, have traveled to India and back with a steady stream of experiences of higher consciousness and occasional bolts of lightning. In this show, I want to honor both streams of learning. I hope to share the power of knowledge as well as courageous actions in daily life to surprise and transform. I will be interviewing a wide range of relationship experts and you know what you might call, but I don't think of as ordinary people for their experiences, insights, and the magic in their stories. We will look at, at problems in mental emotional and social behavior that seem to plague us, to explore how relationships bind us and ultimately free us from our troubles. Um, so a little bit about me, more specifically, I was raised in St. Johnsbury, Vermont, which is in the northeastern corner of Vermont, a town of 10,000 as the oldest daughter of a physician and of six siblings. My parents were both the youngest in their families. In my world, that will tell you all you need to know about me. <laughs> and, and, you know, perhaps over the weeks, you'll learn more about what that might mean and why I, I feel that that's a shorthand uh, description of who I am. I was trained as a psychiatric clinical social worker at UCLA in the early 80s at the Neuropsychiatric Institute and worked in a Los Angeles psychiatric hospital as a group and family therapist until I moved back home to my hometown, St. Johnsbury. There, I worked in addiction treatment and community-based treatment of sexual abuse and sex offenders. Here, I also began working in the workplace as a therapist and consultant. Facing my inability to be my new self in my family, I was fortunate to find a mentor in Bowen Family Systems Theory in Burlington, Vermont. Uh, as a, yeah, I, I actually discovered a book called The Therapist's Own Family from a mail order psychotherapy book club. 
And um, even though I had heard of Bowen theory in graduate school, that topic seemed to be exactly what I needed. And that really started me on this path, thanks to Peter Teitelman, I have to give him credit for that book. I then, when I began studying Bowen theory while I was living in my hometown, close to my family, um, but after several years, I moved to Burlington, Vermont, where I had a private practice and continued to work in businesses. Uh, I eventually became the founding president of the Vermont Center for Family Studies. And while I was there, I developed relationships with the national and international network of colleagues working with Bowen theory. In 2008, I began the study of a large social system. So my interest in the um, multi-generational family and family systems in the complicated work systems in workplaces, um, I was also always fascinated from my social policy studies in social work um, to how these dynamics played out in large social systems. Um, so in 2008, I uh, entered a doctoral program in educational policy and leadership studies at the University of Vermont. Um, and I graduated in 2016 with a doctorate, a story in and of itself. Currently, I am based in Scottsdale, Arizona. As, and it's on the trail of my lifelong passion of exploring both geography and cultural differences uh, in our country. I'm the mother of two sons, a daughter-in-law and a granddaughter. And as we progress, I will share many stories from my large dynamic family. Today, um, the topic for today's show is a conversation with myself and Priscilla to introduce to you how a systems view of the family provides a pathway to developing individuality over the course of a lifetime. And I guess in a way I consider um, the progress toward becoming more and more of an individual to be a, a spiritual path. Um, it's, you know, some people call it individuation or self-actualization. In our world, we call it differentiation, but it's really about becoming more and more of who you truly are in the in the uh, cauldron of all the pressures of being a social creature in a social family and in your social relationships. Um, so that's, that's something I'm grappling with all the time and the, Priscilla and I are gonna tackle today. So, hello, Priscilla. Hello, thank <laughs> you for wanting to hear your voice. <laughs> um, so I am, I'm, I guess I will introduce you. You've seen, okay. yeah, and if there's, uh, uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to respond <clears throat> or fill in something. In 1978, Priscilla moved to Washington, D.C. from Kansas to study family systems theory with Dr. Murray Bowen at the Georgetown Family Center. Dr. Bowen is the uh, originator of Bowen family systems theory. Um, her first appointment was in the biofeedback clinic with Lillian Rosenbaum, where she began a lifelong study of the power of self-regulation and neurofeedback as a tool for advancing self-knowledge in the context of the complex family emotional system. That's a big sentence, and we'll talk a little <laughs> bit more about that. <laughs> when she joined the faculty, she served as director of the special postgraduate program, among other teaching and administrative roles. In 1989, shortly before his death, Dr. Bowen asked her to assist the Bowen family and the Bowen Center to preserve and make his collection of written audio and video materials available to the world. They are now housed in the National Library of Medicine. In 2005, Priscilla founded the Learning Space in DC and 
and, and eventually initiated with her colleagues na uh, Navigating Systems DC. And those colleagues are Kathy Weissman and Andrea Shara. She conducts base, basic and advanced training for leadership consultants, owners and members of family enterprises and individuals motivated to learn how to be their best self in complex relationship systems. Priscilla comes from a Mennonite family in Kansas. She is married to a delightful man of solid Appalachian stock <laughs> who shares my fascination with ants. <laughs> and, and her extended family is a rich network from both lineages. And why have I asked her to open this platform with me? Um, she has walked side by side with me on this journey for 33 years. While our stories are unique, we share the experience of falling deeply in love with Bowen Family Systems Theory. Um, just a side note, Bowen Family Systems Theory is not what I would consider it in the mainstream. And over the years, it's it just, there's a particular type of person who gets interested and takes this long study of Bowen family systems theory. Um, so that's why I say we fall, we share this experience. It's in a sense, it's, it's not common and it isn't actually even necessary really to use the theory, but that's one thing we have in common. Along the way, she has been my mentor and supervisor. Uh, she's been a colleague and a friend. We have had many conversations about theory, the application of the theory in families and social groups, um, evidence for the theory in the physiology, and the role of spirituality in a science-based framework for human behavior. When we met, I was discovering Bowen theory in Burlington, Vermont, under the supervision of Ann Bunting, who is my mentor. I met Priscilla when she came to Vermont as a presenter for a clinical conference in 1990. In 1992, I entered the special postgraduate program at the Family Center, and Priscilla was my supervisor. We'll hear a little story about that. I then trained in biofeedback and neurofeedback under Priscilla's supervision. In 2002, we co-led a biofeedback research seminar at the center, which is now called the Bowen Center for the Study of the Family. So after the upcoming break, we will each describe early experiences in our own family lives that embodied the deep and mysterious family connections. For myself, this experience brought family theory alive. When I saw how cutoffs and prior generations lived in me, I saw that there was a path to independence from family patterns. From Priscilla, I look Today, what will we hear? I look forward to her story. Um, so Priscilla, any, any comments or thoughts before we take a break? Oh, there's such a wonderful history. And uh, uh, there's so many things you brought up I look forward to kind of touching. There is, uh, you know, I think about the scope of these 30 years and just all that is really the in-depth uh, path, I guess I would say, given the audience mm -hmm. you're talking to, uh, a path of what, what this process of differentiation is as a discipline uh, in considering the systems that we're a part of as integral to uh, defining our own path and whatever differentiation or individuation, whatever words you choose to work. The important part is the the system and how you learn about how it works and how you fit into it. I think that is the crux. So I look forward to talking about some of the details, flush them out. Great, good. So in the next segment, we'll, do, we'll dig in. <laughs> we'll get more specific. <laughs> so um, yeah, um, I think this is a good time to take a break. Cool, all clear and just Tease who you are going and you know to the break. Like, don't forget, you're listening to me. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, 
Oh, yeah. going. So going, people would, yeah, some going some out of thing. going out. Oh, yeah, I would. Break. Oh, okay, all right, yeah. okay, all right. Toot your horn, girl. Toot your horn. <laughs> <laughs> Relationships with mercy. Yeah, for there sure. you go. <laughs> well, I did choose the podcast cover that has my name in bigger fonts. So how about that? <laughs> It's getting there, Mercy. You're working it. Oh, my God. (laughs) Oh, my. My father was all about not tooting your own horn. These themes happen everywhere. Everywhere. Right. Right. So. I always, I covered it. (laughs) Yeah, that was very good, actually. I thought that was very, I thought that represented you. And I uh-huh. it was a good introduction to the relationship, which I think is important. And then we can kind of go from there. Yeah. And it was fair to you. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I think it was very, very well done. So do you want to. So in ter- talking about the experience with the family, would you like to go first? Why don't you go first? OK, I'll ask the question. OK, I'll, I'll set up the question. Um, your experience with family that cultivate, you know, that catapulted your study yeah. and exploration. And I'm, I'm just going to. Yeah, I think I'll talk about it from the big picture, but also kind of the beginning and yeah. how it played out from the very beginning. For this. Yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. For this one. <laughs> for this little piece. Because, right, we'll try to do this in the next 20 minute segment or 17 minutes, whatever it is. Okay. Seventy six. So I've been almost involved 50 years. Nothing. Yeah. In the 60th. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. It's all 50 good. years was, it's 52 already since yeah, 1970. So I'm going to play a little bit of the music. I'll fade it down and you can go. Okay. All right. Stand by. Hello. This is Mercy Russell with The Remarkable Relationship Show. And I'm here today with Priscilla Friesen. um, And we're going to now dive deeply into, well, somewhat deeply, maybe not to the bottom. A steep dive. (laughs) Yeah, we'll do a steeper dive into (laughs) our experiences, you know, really kind of um, learning about ourselves through our family system. So I'm going to ask Priscilla to lead off in this, in this segment, um, where we're going to each talk about personal experiences that we had. Um, so the, 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 the question, Priscilla, is what was your experience with family that catapulted your lifelong study and exploration of the family emotional system? Wow. I love that. That's such a good, big overarching question. You know, I was just thinking about this. So I've been involved in this about 48 years. So I was introduced kind of in graduate school about five years after my mother had died in 1971. And I have to say, again, given my whole scope of my life, death has been the key. My experience with Uh, understanding the disruption, the remarkable disruption that happened with my mother's death, her illness and her death in our family that was a family kind of located separate from from the extended family, kind of a little isolated unit with that death. And only, you know, over all these years do I really appreciate how isolated that unit was and what an amazing job it did do in adapting. What my takeaway from that period was at that point in time is that I really did not compute, frankly, and I'm embarrassed how how, uh, disconnected I was, but it's a clue 
that I did not connect my miserable emotional experience of depression and disorientation, I would say anxiousness, with the fact my mother had died. It took me five years when graduate school happened to, to have that even be a part of my experience. So that was obviously very big and a big pivot point, I think, from the beginning. What I learned, I would say the first, the opening to understanding, first of all, that my mother's death was crucial to me and my orientation in life was number one. And secondly, I did not appreciate um, my, uh, how much simply having contact with people that our family had become uh, somewhat disconnected from given the nine years of my mother's illness mm -hmm. and her death, you know, a young family at a distance, the routines of what could be the supports of the extended family, while they were, there were connections, it wasn't, they weren't a part of life. And what happened in our family, I think was a, um, an adaptation that included people from our social network, but the disconnect from the family itself only became more clear to me as I spent the next, I would say, 10 years mm -hmm. really becoming more that my extended family became more a part of my adult life. Now, what was interesting was, is that my emotional state, you know, people talk about grief and all this kind of unresolved stuff. What happened when I first went back to my, the, the first thing that happened was, is I went back to my mother's grave from Kansas to Ohio. I went back myself and a very interesting thing happened then. There are, there are a lot of synchronicities that happened, but the interesting thing I thought was, that the link to kind of my spiritual experience happened then. So I was at my mother's grave. I'm looking off into the feet, uh, off into the hundred yards away. And there was this very interesting um, woman who was placing flowers on an, a new grave. The interesting thing that my mother's death and the ensuing, it also included the uh, interruption of a marriage. That was happening simultaneous to my trip. I looked in the, into the distance and there was my married name on that tombstone. And I thought, wow, that is amazing. Here, isn't this totally symbolic? Here I am. And here, there, there is this uh, woman here and she is, and it's a death of my marriage. It's a reigniting with my mother. So I, I noticed it and I, computed it. And then I went back and I went back to my meditating and writing that I was doing. So about a half hour later, I get in the car and I drive past what did not exist. That stone did not exist. There was not a new grave and there was no woman. Now, it kind of takes my breath away in a way to, mm -hmm. to experience that in fact, what am I creating? What is my life? How am I, how does this really work? And I'm telling you that that woman was as real as real could be. And that tombstone was as real as could be. And to experience this kind of in this simultaneous experience of kind of re-engaging this in my mother, this very important disconnect, this time period that was so important, and then kind of seeing that this is much more expansive than I, I, this is another aspect of this. And it, it lives with me today. I don't think that was, um, I think that was important that those two things happen simultaneously, given the rest of what I've learned kind of over time, kind of exploring, you know, what death has meant over mm -hmm. the generations. That's kind of, that can be kind of a next deep dive. But I think that was my first kind of, whoa, and then it was not long after that, that the disorientation that was more emotional eased. And I ceased having the depression and the anxiety that I experienced. So Priscilla, what, 
What do you make of that experience now? Well, I, I think I make, of, I make of it two things. One is that the very, my very nature is so, it is my mother and my family. It, it the, the engagement, the nature of how I am in my family and in the relationship with this disruption with my mother, to me has kind of, as I think about it now, you know, 45 years mm -hmm. later, I think that that to me kind of crystallized um, the nature of the, the most important attachments and the disruption kind of highlighted to me, um, the disruption highlighted than how essential relationships are to one's own stability and one's own functioning mm -hmm. and how disconnects have all kind have a range. You know, I always thought my, my extended family was, I love my family, but I wasn't connected to them. They were not a part of what, right. what held our system. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that there was that my mother's death, which I took so personally, even thought that I was going to die young. That's how deep it is. That in fact, that's that's five generations old in my mother's family, where we, where a mother, where her grandmother, uh, her great great grandmother died in childbirth, and her grandmother, who was eighteen months old, then went on to marry and lose three children. And then my, you know, so my grandmother was the strong one in that group of everybody dying. And she ended up in this position of compromise and decreasing her functioning. I only knew her with decreased functioning. I didn't know her. Right. Self. And my mother was responding to all that. And I was responding to my mother. Right. So for our listeners, this experience of seeing the gravestone with your married name on it that then wasn't there yeah that in a way shocked you to see that it wasn't there right, right. how do you understand that you, that you saw that or that that appeared to you visually <laughs> I think, I, you know, it's only in hindsight that I, uh -huh. re, re, I thought of it a certain way then. And I think of it a little bit differently now. I think it, it, in some ways, that period of my life and that experience was kind of a prototype. It's like, this is how it works, Priscilla. Get it. That these are how you, how you create what you think is meaning includes this remarkable live natural world mm -hmm. happenings that is a part of this multi-generational history. And it's this, it's that you make it up. You see it, you see things that are also a part of how this works. Uh -huh. it was a, are you saying it was like, as if you thought about that what you saw was in a way a projection of all of this multi-generational experience around death, that it had come out in a way almost from you as a projection, almost symbolically or something, but it was experienced to you as real. As real. It wasn't a fuzzy thing. That, no. You know, it and, it's, and, and the key all. is it surprised you. You weren't looking for something like that. It was stunning. Yeah. Absolutely stunning. And it include this other very important thing, which was a marriage that had really been kind of my help when my mother was dying. When your mother died. So it's all a part of the same right. thing. And it died too. It died too. And also, interestingly, that, that death uh, of that also then became, I mean, really an open door for you to then begin to see more clearly 
what you were living, which had to do with the death of your mother, right? Yeah. So the yeah. marriage kind of carried you along for a while, but then there was a point at which it didn't work anymore. If we could look, if I looked at it from the, you know, out here, not in your life. Um, and then you were in the process of letting it go, not necessarily knowing what it was leading you to, but that experience then also sort of almost dropped in to help you say, see, oh my goodness, <laughs> how can this is, there's, there's a bigger, there's such a, there's a connection here that I hadn't seen. Yeah. But it was so interesting. It wasn't a gravestone. It wasn't your mother you saw, you know, it wasn't, it was so interesting that it was that symbol of the, the death of the marriage. That. You know, over, over time, just to back up on that, I, you know, so with time, I learned so much more about how to think about how my marriage functioned mm -hmm. for the group. So you could think about it as I got married very young. No one in my family ever get married at 18, but we decided to marry 10 days after my mother had her, her uh, diagnosis of her bone cancer. 10 days, 10 days. We were married that summer. And my mother had decline in her health that year. My husband, who was a good buddy of mine and, you know, like had been around all through high school and his parents became like aunt, aunts and uncles to me. Right. Uh -huh. and, he, and they were and they have to this day been essential to that time period. Right. Very important parts of what I would call the emotional unit, the group that that was surviving. They were, of an, and when my mother died, my father remarried, my marriage didn't function in the same way anymore. And it was, it was almost as if it was okay. It went on. He married and had five kids and right. I was a good friend, you know, it, it right. It, anyway. So in so, many ways, it wasn't a failed marriage. It was a marriage that had served its purpose, literally. Right. 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 And so he, just, mm -hmm. and he was a dear friend for my life. Right. Um, I, just again, going back to the experience of what you saw, <clears throat> there would be, you know, thoughts out there really from the world that's more of supernatural phenomena or spirituality that, um, you know, understands that or sees the the cosmos such as that your people who have died can come in and give us experiences or appear to us or at certain times and I just wanted to mention that as that um, at least in my thinking the fact that you saw that wasn't simply a psychological projection or a hallucination it in a yeah. sense, it could have been something that emerged from the system, which could still, which still obviously included your dead mother, right? And in the spiritual world, they say, yeah, she's up there. And, you know, she kind of gave you this little download. Mm -hmm. um, but even if you're just looking, if you're not wedded to that view of the cosmos, what Bowen theory allows you to see is that deep connection that's mm -hmm. still there and that the people are, and that we are living in fact my story which i'll tell in the next segment after our break um talks about how these past generations of people we never knew never had contact with hardly know their stories live in us right. in very as you and i like to say embodied ways right, right. through our perceptions and and in our direct experiences um it's not just an academic yeah. idea. I, I think just to put in kind of a, a summary for myself, I think what um, family systems theory has contributed to me is a, it's kind of a bridge in a way between the tangible understanding of how these interrelationships have functioned to survive over the generations that live in me today. All of this lives in me today in a way that I think you could 
call it past lives or something, but it doesn't need to be that. It can be very, it's very, it, it is more towards the science of how this works. Mm-hmm. I think that has been kind of the linking to me. There, I've had other experiences with my mother that have been very, you know, like driving with me places that have been accessible in a different way. This was much more tangible. Mm-hmm. This was much more tangible. And I think was kind of like a, this is the way it works, Priscilla. Right. I want you to pay this. This is it. Right. Right. She was so many connections made in that choice of the, however you call it, the visitation or the projection or whatever you, however you frame it. It just, the, the way that it worked. And this is what you and I like to do, dive deep into those experiences, right? And see all the connections. Um, so it's time for us to take another break. And when we come back, we'll continue this conversation. I'm going to tell a, a little story about myself and how this, uh, how I, yeah, how this theory came alive for me. Um, and then hopefully we'll get a chance to sort of talk a little more openly um, about this for our listeners. So this is Mercy Russell with the Remarkable Relationship Show, and we'll be back in a few minutes. Perfect. Nice job. Yeah. Okay. Crushed it. Okay. So, what, does that make any sense to you, Benny? What we're talking about? Oh yeah, hundred percent. I, I had a caller that wanted to <laughs> okay. make sure we were <laughs> making sure we're coming back to it because he was like, "You teased it at the beginning." Oh he, what? You need need to know more about the guest, and I'm like, "Yeah, we're getting to it." <laughs> <laughs> oh, he wanted to know more about you. Ah, yeah. got gotcha. you. Yeah. Gotcha, yeah. <laughs> Who is she anyway? It's coming, it's coming. Oh, that's like we'll get to that. It's her first show. <laughs> She'll get to it. <laughs> Oh, he wants to know more about Priscilla? Both. Oh, Both. Yeah. yeah. Didn't I tell that? I didn't the first segment say something about that? That's a Are deeper. We... Oh, they want to know more about us. Well, that's the whole idea. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's great. Who are these people anyway? <laughs> And then uh, just quick reminder, we have to be yeah. off the air at 59. So I will Alrighty. give those cues here. Um, okay. And if you're early, great. If you're late, I got to like start doing one of those. So yeah, that's fine. But you'll be good. You're good. Put you in the grave. <laughs> <laughs> Clank. Yeah, right. Mid sentence. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, I've li- I've listened to Benny a lot because I listened to Marie Manasheri's show and he produces it. And I've heard this a lot. We got to get off the air. Yeah. <laughs> the music's playing. <laughs> That's all right. Something, you just got to do it. Yeah. You have to connect me to this, to the, how do I, how I get access because I don't, I have, I'm not listening to your intro to this. What do you mean? I don't, how, do, how would I get to see any of the, the programming from this station oh. or whatever that is? Oh, oh yeah. Well, you can, go, there's a website where it streams. Yeah, so if we you can do 1150kknw.com, that's our website and you can stream there. And then also we're simulcasting to YouTube, so it'll be thrown there. And then when I'm done with the show, I'll edit it down and send it back to Mercy so she has a copy of it too. So, Right. And then it's going to be podcast too through your station. Yeah. So uh, podcast one is where it will be as well. And then that'll be posted on different platforms. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like Spotify or Apple. Yep. Mm-hmm. All the good ones. Apple. Maybe we should have said you live someplace beside DC, Priscilla. <laughs> <laughs> right, come back. Holding it down. <laughs> I've got to try to remember that to put that in at the end. About hello, this is Mercy Russell with the Remarkable Relationship Show, and um, I'm back again for the our third segment with uh, in my conversation with Priscilla Friesen. Uh, we're talking today about um, how. Uh, family, our, our deep relationship of 30 or 40 years with a Bowen family systems theory, a way of looking at the, the family and human behavior has, um, has deepened and catapulted 
our our uh, our own journeys to become really more of a self. Um, <clears throat> so at any rate, Priscilla just talked about one of the early experiences she had <clears throat> that not only uh, sort of was extraordinary, but also um, opened the door for her to see the connection between her own personal experience and her family life over generations. So I'm going to now tell you my story. Um, I think in the intro to this, I talked about my background and how I discovered Bowen theory, a little bit about my history. Um, and so I just, I started studying Bowen theory and met <clears throat> Priscilla in, 18, in 1989. Uh, I was living in Burlington, Vermont and studying with my mentor there. Um, Priscilla was living in Washington, D.C. Um, and working at the Georgetown Family Center with Dr. Murray Bowen, who is the creator of this theory. Um, and um, my mentor had also studied at the, at, in Washington, D.C. with directly with Dr. Bowen. By, in 19, by 1992, I decided to go and do my own postgraduate training in Washington, D.C., and at that time, Priscilla was the director of the special postgraduate program. It was special because we were people from out of, out of state who were coming in for four weekends a year or four, you know, three, four day, three or four day <laughs> segments a, a year to study theory. And um, we each had our own clinical supervisor. And Priscilla was my supervisor. So we not only had sort of lectures and a, a group supervision while we were there, but we also followed with our supervisors on an individual basis. And the focus of training was, is, in Bowen theory, is your work on your own family. So it, the, 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 I think the fact is that until you can be a self in your own family and see how your own family works in this as a complex relationship system, you really are not in a, you really need that in order to help other people to do the same thing. Um, so that's what, that's what I was doing. Now, at the same time, Priscilla, as I mentioned before, was director of, I think you were director of the biofeedback program at the family center. And so as part of my interest in general, I would get on the biofeedback equipment with Priscilla when I went to Washington. And um, I was getting just getting to know Priscilla. Um, and at the time, the biofeedback program consisted of the use of um, hand temperature biofeedback, sweat response biofeedback or EMDR. It's what's used in um, lie detector tests and muscle tension. So those would be the types of leads that would have been on my body and the type of physiology we were tracking. And the way that we did this is that I would, you know, sit in a session like I was having a regular consultation, but hooked up to the equipment. And while I was talking, Priscilla would be taking note of the shifts or the changes in the physiology, because it was all live that you could see. And I also practiced this way after I trained with Priscilla. And what I, what you, what I would do is usually not necessarily pay attention directly to, but I would keep, uh, what I would do is keep track of the time and what we were talking about, because the equipment itself would, at the end of the session, give you a report of how the pieces of physiology shifted. Right. So I, you know, I would just be, oh, she talked about this at this moment, at this moment, at this moment. So when I went back to see what, what happened when her hand temperature dropped, which would have meant been a sign of anxiety, if I'm with a client, I would have known, oh, what was she talking about? That her physiology made that little dip, that there was a little anxiety there. She might not have been aware of it. So that's, that was sort of the way we were using biofeedback in those days. So, and I was just really getting to know Priscilla, I believe. And one of the things that as a supervisor or therapist that you do with Bowen theory is that you take a, a history, you draw a diagram of the family and take a history of functional facts, births, deaths, 
the, you know, the, the dates of marriages, divorces, that kind of thing. So um, I was sitting in a session hooked up with Priscilla and I was simply telling her the facts of my family. And the important fact in this situation is that my mother, um, uh, my mother never knew her father. So my mother's parents were um, married at age 16 when my grandmother became pregnant with my uncle. And then my grandmother became pregnant with my mother two years later. And when she was, when my, and, and her husband was a, was a German, a young German boy with red hair. And their first son was a boy with red hair. And my mother had black hair. And when she was born, her, my grandmother's husband, my mother's father denied my mother and said, this is not my child because she had black hair. Um, no genetic testing in those days. And they separated. My grandmother took my mother off into an apartment and my, uh, uh, the man who would be, I think is my grandfather, took my uncle into back to his parents' house. So this is just a fact. I knew it growing up. My grandmother remarried. I grew up with another man as my grandfather. She, she remarried when my, father, my mother was seven. These were just the facts in the family. I never met that man who was my mother's father and didn't, never heard much about him. I knew my uncle and my cousins. They had some contact with him, but never talked about it. My mother had no feeling about it. She didn't care. She just said, well, he, I never knew him. He's, he's nobody to me, right? So if you asked any questions, she just was like, she just didn't care. If you asked my grandmother, she'd say, well, I didn't. I, at that point, I hadn't ever talked to my grandmother. So let's leave that part out. Because <laughs> I didn't, you know, to me, it was just like, okay, you want to draw a diagram? Well, there was this. And then my grandmother remarried. And then there was the next grandfather and da, da, da. So anyway, after the session, we looked at the, my physiology and my hand temperature. I mean, my sweat response, which is what's used in lie detector tests. So if your sweat response spikes, it's an indication of anxiety, increased anxiety. That my hand temper, my hand sweat response spiked when I was talking about that grandfather I never knew. And this like blew me away because he meant nothing to me. It was, he wasn't even a, a figure in a storybook. He was just a, something, some remote fact. Why would my, of all the things I was talking, because I talked about a lot of other things in, the, in that session, including my marriage, my, you know, stuff with my siblings, with my mother, but that's when it spiked. And that was really shocked me to think that in my body, there was that anxiety living about the fact that my mother's father rejected her when nobody in the family ever talked about it as being anything other than a random fact. It wasn't a shameful, it wasn't, my grandmother remarried very well. It was just, I mean, at any rate, so there, why would it live in my body? I couldn't believe it. So that was what really just cemented for me, the fact that the family emotional system is, integral to who I am and that this cutoff in fact the fact that nobody talked about it or knew anything about it acted like it didn't exist and these were cousins who lived actually you know within you know three miles of my mother right who she had no contact that whole family so at any rate <clears throat> that was my experience <laughs> And it wasn't, the thing that really, I think, caught me about it, too, was it wasn't, there was, I, it wasn't anything made up in my mind. I, I mean, I couldn't, there was nothing psychological about it. Yeah. And yeah. I know that that was the beginning of my real commitment to really understanding more about the physiology and the links between science and this world of 
self-development, psychology, trying to be a better self, understanding your family, which had all been very psychologized in the culture. And I thought, oh, no, this is living really in our bodies. This is not something created out of our, this theory was not created out of our minds. You know, it's, it is aiming to see what really is and how it lives in us. Um, so that was the beginning of that. <laughs> I just, so what I did then eventually was to undertake a, over the years, um, I undertook a long project and it took a long time to get to know that grandfather. And, um, <clears throat> and that's another long story that I have to tell, but there was a lot of resistance in the family to even thinking that that was important. I got a lot of pushback from my mother. I did learn more about him because I pursued a relationship with my uncle and my grand and then I had my grandmother in order to learn more about this because somehow I made the connection and I know Priscilla, you helped me with this that the current life problems I was having were linked to this cutoff, this fact, this absolute psychological denial of my mother's that this man, that her, who her father was, was not important to her. Um, whether it was that man or another man. And my grandmother had, she had a funny little story about it. So that was kind of my experience. And um, I guess what I just want to convey about it is what a shock it was. Um, I just hadn't occurred to me how things in your family from another generation could live in your own reactivity. Um, I then came over the years to begin to understand how that then affected the way I saw the world and related to people and then and, and, and by trying as a self, as a person, as an individual to, to think and move for myself in the family around those facts yeah. brought up a lot of information about the family that I never would have seen otherwise. I think that's such a good example of the, the disconnects, what we make up as fact or what we think and act as if things are what they are. And so much, uh, I think what this understanding about the family and the multi-generational family is that it contributes facts to what our reactivity may be that we're attributing things to right. that may not be accurate. And this was a beautiful example. I think the physiology is gold because it is, it is a more accurate language, right. I think, for the emotional system because it bypasses this stuff you make up. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And um, yeah, I, I love, um, I just would just sort of want to tip my hat to Marie Manicheri, who is really how I was introduced to this station. And, you know, she has another way of talking about, you know, how our lives, our past lives live in our cells and in, in, the, in the body, um, which is also very intriguing, but this totally makes sense to me because, um, because I've had this experience. We only have a, two minutes left, but I think what I want to do is to highlight my hope today was to, which of course, I think it was over ambitious, but was to get to the fact that this, um, I think what's really Im important here is that uh, what I want to sort of continue to explore is how understanding and seeing your life as you were given it or you, you, you created it by coming in or choosing this family, how this, your, your life in your, this complex multi-generational family system protects us, um, gives us comfort, we're social creatures, but also how understanding that is your path to freedom to become more of who you want to be as an individual. So Beautiful. this is just my little introduction to that. And um, I, I just am fascinated with both my individuality and your individuality and your family. And I really, I'm really looking forward to exploring this more with 
stories of friends and colleagues and hopefully eventually with you i hope eventually to have a calling component of the show and um, so we can talk about what you're up against and how this way of looking at behavior can help us. So this is Mercy Russell with the Remarkable Relationship Show. I've been talking with Priscilla Friesen um, and we will, uh, she, we will post how you can get in touch with her. You can reach me at leadershipwithmercy.com 